evening. Welcome back to the Wildlands. And in tonight's episode, we're preparing for summer and the possible drought. So that's servicing our pumps, looking at our water management and getting that all ready so that we are prepared just in case it's excessively hot and or if there's a drought, but just for general watering. Also, I'll repair the guttering. We start filling up our IBCs, all as part of the water management. What else do we get up to this week, Missy? I prepare a no-dig bed for my vegetable plants, and then I decided to take it a little bit uber and put in a beautiful spiral footpath. Oh, it's fabulous. Wait till you see that later. I get my banana circle started. So I can show you that and the logic behind that. So that's also very exciting. And as promised, we give you a little look at our seedlings. Yeah, that's very exciting. So enjoy tonight's episode. living in a house when I had my garden and when we had an allotment was an abundance of water and all connected to the mains. And here off grid in Portugal, A, we don't have an abundance of water necessarily and we have to get our water out of a well. So what I'm doing this morning is I'm preempting the summer and the late part of the spring when we'll need to be drawing water out of our well. So the first thing to do was to walk down the land, which is about a 15 minute walk, carrying me petrol so that I can go and see if I can start the pump down at the well and then pump up water and fill up the IBCs at the top. So as you can see, I'm having a trouble starting the pump. Doesn't look like it's gonna start. Probably something very simple, a blockage, or the fact that it's had petrol left in the bottom. Very straightforward. So we take it to Reggae Centro, it's under guarantee. And then hopefully we can use our backup pump. If that's also not working, then we will have to take that to be serviced too. So let's see how we're doing with our backup pump. Will that start? So great news, at least one out of the two pumps has started, so at least we can carry on storing water and getting used to the mindset of always having the water filled to the top in the IBCs as and when the drought suddenly hits, although we have many months to wait before that is the case. And also a chore that I've been putting off, very simple and straightforward, took me about an hour in the end, was to get the guttering repaired and replaced over the four IBCs on the back of the shade house. Again, if you've watched us last summer, you'll remember that we have four IBCs there. We collect 4,000 litres of rainwater. And although the grey guttering was faulty and melted last summer, we still managed to collect 4,000 litres over the beginning of the winter. Excellent work on the pumps there. And uh, it's good news that the backup one is working. Not so good news that the decent one is not working. No, but we'll get that serviced so that it's ready to go. Look forward to carrying that up the land. Absolutely, it's a heavy <laughs> bugger, isn't it? And I'm really impressed with the guttering as well. It looks really swanky and it's hopefully not going to melt this no. year. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy that we put the other one up and it melted. And funnily enough, the white one that we've just put up, we bought first. But because we went to buy guttering when I think everyone in the whole of Portugal was buying guttering because yep. it was going to rain before last summer, we didn't have all the bits to go with the white guttering. So the white guttering has sat outside in the whole of last summer and did not melt. So I hold out high hopes for that one working through the summer. And you said it was easier to fit than it, the yeah, previous very, one as well. Yeah, it's very watertight, yep. So the next lot of rain is due next week, yes. hopefully. So we'll be able to fill up our IBCs up the top from our rainwater catchment system. Fingers crossed for rain, because we haven't had any for a long time now. No. So it was very, very wet and we were like, it's the wettest winter on record. And then it stopped raining. <laughs> it stopped. And we haven't had any rain for like two months. No. So just a bit of drizzle. Good getting the pumps working and the guttering yeah. on. So while I was sorting out the guttering, you've been very busy. What have you been up to? I have. I've been making a huge swathe of the food forest is now a nice no dig bed. So that means I've used the same that I used in the hoop house. I've put down homemade compost and then cardboard on top of that to suppress the weeds and then bagged compost on top of that. And then I realized that actually the bed was so big that I wouldn't be able to get to all the plants in the middle to either plant them or harvest them. So I put in a cute little path. Yeah, it's very swanky. <laughs> it's very cute, very Instagram. 
So first of all, I'm going to show you Missy's construction of the bed very quickly in time lapse, and then at the end you can see how funky it looks. I'll get the drone out and show everyone what it looks yeah. like from the air. That'll be cool. Yeah, I'm going to try and be clever with my planting as well, so that you can actually keep to see the spiral all the year round. bed is nearly done now. It's been covered in our homemade compost, cardboard and then bag compost on top ready to plant into and I've just cleared a spiral shaped footpath going all the way to the centre so that there's lots of room you can get right in there and I'm hoping that once it's all planted up it's going to look really beautiful too. Just about to add the bark chippings to finish that off and then the bed will be done. And it's finished. Bark chips down. I've made an extra little cut through path just over there. I've tidied up around all the strawberries and I've added a bit of extra compost. So this whole bed is now ready for a decent watering if we get some rain and, uh, and they're ready for the plants to go in. So there's Missy's spiral. Wow, doesn't it look cute? I really like that. It's Gorgeous. Smart. It's going to look lovely when it's planted up. Yeah, I'm really happy with how it's turned out. So if we take a walk over this side, I can show you the banana circle, which I've now started. If that's going to look funky as well from the air. Gonna, it is going to look <laughs> funky, yeah. And it's perfectly round, which is unusual for me. <laughs> I did measure it all out properly. Yeah, it looks really neat. So I've been on a quest. You've already seen in last week's video that I had a couple of bananas and I've wrapped them. I've got another two bananas today and I'm going to wrap them and that's just to keep them protected in the frost for the next couple of weeks. And then once the risk of frost has gone, I can get my banana circle planted up. And I will do a whole video on the banana circle, how to construct it, how it works, because you can grow bananas and get them to fruit and provide you with bananas to eat in cold countries or colder countries, so the UK. That's exciting. Parts of America, Colorado. You wouldn't believe it, would no, you? Absolutely. So, and that's what we're hoping here because last night it was minus four in the greenhouse. Mm. So I would imagine it was probably minus six outside, which is way too cold for fruiting bananas, which require between five and 10 degrees minimum. And they take up to four years to fruit. So you've obviously got to protect them for that time in the winter so that you can get lovely bananas in your own garden. Exciting. So you might remember in previous videos, on our permaculture journey. I called this bed here and Missy to the tropical bed and it's where I was gonna plant ornamental bananas. 
and other tropical looking plants, gingers, carnas, and so on. And then Missy said to me, why don't you create a banana circle? And I must admit, being entirely honest, I had heard of banana circles vaguely, but I wasn't really aware of what their purpose was. A bit like permaculture, swales and berms. Now that I've researched those, I feel very confident in how they work. So the basic premise of a banana circle is you dig a hole, concave bowl shaped hole, in the middle, which is round and about a metre wide, up to two metres would be the maximum sort of size. And then the earth that you take out from the hole, you put round the outside, making a kind of giant donut. And then the hole that you've created is then about three feet deep from the bottom of the hole to the top of the berms at the side or the ridges. And then you fill this hole, which is also like this shape. You fill it as if you were making a compost heap. So you would put logs and so on at the bottom and then smaller twigs and straw and rotting material and garden waste and kitchen waste as if exactly as if you were creating a compost heap. And then that starts rotting down and creates nutrients in the circle. And then on the berm around the outside, the big circle that's mounted up, you plant your bananas hence it being called a banana circle. And the idea is, is that you can also use the hole filled with compost to get rid of water, grey water, kitchen water, shower water and so on. Chuck it in the middle of the hole. That's what a lot of people in tropical countries use banana circles for, as well as for growing bananas to eat. So you can watch a separate video where I show you how to build the banana circle yourself. So there's my banana circle. It looks really cute. Thanks. Yeah, it's going to be funky. I'm really looking forward to planting it up. Yeah. And seeing how well it works. I'm growing lemongrass especially for you. Because mm. you said that lemongrass yep. goes yep. well around Absolutely, there. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. There are certain guilds that you have to plant and certain things you have to do, which again, I'll show you in a separate video in a lot more detail. But the centre of the banana circle is basically following the Berkeley method of composting, which I would like to thank Alison Ward, who's one of our viewers, and she made me aware of the Berkeley method, which I'd not heard of before. And it's basically a way that you can create compost at very hot temperatures over a very short period of time, about 18 days. So we're gonna try that in compost making terms so that we've got more compost, but that's essentially what I'm doing in the center of the banana circle. And the idea in short is that as that heats up, it provides your bananas with extra warmth in their little circle, which is like a microclimate and then all the nutrients from the compost as you water it ooze into the ground and your bananas go, mm, lots of compost, let's go really fast. Brilliant. So thanks very much to Alison for sharing that with me. Really appreciate that. And we'll also try that out next month, I think. Awesome. Last week I promised you a look at my seeds. So we're down here at the cold frame. I'll just give you a quick run through of everything that I'm growing here and then you tell you some of the particulars. So we have some mange too and lots and lots of peas few tomatoes just as an experiment to see if growing them this early gives them any kind of advantage in the year. We've got some spinach, wild garlic, lots and lots of rhubarb. Again a little experiment there. Some of them it said on the packet to soak the rhubarb seeds so I tried some of them soaked and some of them not soaked and they've all germinated just as well as each other. We've got spring onions, rocket, mustard and red salad bowl. They were all coming up really nicely. They were all sown at the beginning of February. Here we've got a lot of um, herbs. So we've got some holy basil tulsi, dill from saved seeds, dill from bought seeds. Again, another little experiment, see if my home saved seeds come up well. Chives, peppermint, valerian, anise, and black cumin, also known as nigella or love in a mist. You can save the seeds and use them for eating and they look fabulous and they're really good for your pollinators too. In this little tray, we've got um, bell peppers and lots of different types of courgettes, some comfrey, some pumpkins, lemongrass, Lemongrass is supposed to be really hard to sprout germinate. Last year I sowed about 20 seeds. I got about half of those sprouted, um, but only one of the plants survived. They didn't like the hot sun. So this year I'm going to try planting them in slightly shadier conditions. And down at the end, these are all, um, this whole tray is all for the chickens. So I'm, I've sown beetroots and turnips and sturtiums, um, lots of plants that they like to eat. That's going to be planted around the outside of the chicken run for them to peck through the wire of their fence. And then some other things like sage, lemon balm, marigolds and those are all to be planted inside the chicken run which i'll do a whole nother video about uh, but they're not supposed to like eating those so it'd be nice for them to have some foliage to um, sit in and peck around and then finally a little tray of mugwort and that's in its own tray because it needs to be kept with a 
piece of clear plastic over the top and the seeds are teeny tiny, I'll show you those. Uh, they need pricking out individually when they're big enough and putting into other pots. can usually be sown straight in the ground. You can sow them in the ground in winter or in autumn ready to overwinter so they get a nice early start. But we have a lot of mice and voles on our property and I think if I sow peas straight outside they're just going to be nibbled off and you'll think that they've never even germinated. So I like to start mine off in a little plug tray like this. If you look underneath you will see all of their roots. This is why I sit them on top of black plastic and just split open compost bags uh, so that they can't root into the capillary matting. Um, these are, they were sown on the 4th of February, so they're coming up for three weeks old. When they're three weeks old, um, maybe two inches tall, but no taller than that, they'll be ready to go outside and fingers crossed, they'll be tough enough to withstand any hungry mice. And from the cold frame into the greenhouse where Rosie and I have got the majority of our seeds. So here, under these little miniature propagators, I've got a lot of different muses or bananas. As you know from all our videos, I do like a good banana. And then this tray here, which has lots of seeds coming up, is all different sunflowers. These are all rosies, and she's got tomatoes and lettuces, melons, pumpkins, turnips, turnips, sweet williams. And then over in the big white polystyrene seed tray, I've got uh, about a hundred or so marigolds. I've got lots of climbing nasturtiums. I've got sweet peas. I've got morning glory and I've got some passion flowers. So another week is over. Yep. And it's uh, amazingly, it's already four weeks since we started our permaculture journey and our food forest. I think it's still, we're doing really well. We've got loads, of, it's about half of it is looking cultivated and constructed now. It's ready to go and it? yeah. it's getting there. Yeah, and we've got seedlings coming up. So I do believe that in next week's video, I'm going to show you the planting of the first pea um, plug plants that I've grown from seed into the hoop house because they're exciting. nearly ready to go. thank everyone that supported the food forest on buy me a coffee and on patreon absolutely on patreon as well it's wonderful to have so many people supporting us not just with lovely comments but also on buy me a coffee and patreon it's so nice it makes us go warm inside mm -hmm. especially when we get trees because we do like trees don't we, we do so thanks very much and as always thanks very much for watching our wafflings on the wildlands in our permaculture journey and if you have any questions or any thoughts or advice do pop us a, a lovely comment because we'll you read them all, don't you? I do Every read them. I answer one. them all. That's good. Which is getting quite hard sometimes. <laughs> so thanks very much for that, and we'll see you very soon. Bye. Bye.